Hey everyone, and welcome back to another video. A lot of you have asked for this, so here it is. It's another Q&A. Thank you to everyone for submitting questions. I got a whole bunch of them, and if I don't get to all of them today, and if I don't get to yours, I apologize, but hopefully I'll get to it in a future video, whether it's a live Q&A or another one just like this. Now, before we get into the questions, there's just a couple things I want to touch on. If you didn't see my video with the Bernie's Bootlegs podcast channel, please check it out. I'll put the link in the description below. I'll also put a card right here. It was a really fun conversation, and you should check out his channel, what he's doing with all the podcasts. I'm sure you've seen some of his videos, like you know, seven times Michael Brecker went beast mode and all that. Great channel. He's doing a great thing for the scene, and he has a ton of podcasts, and he's pumping them out almost every single day, so go check that one out. If you're wondering why I haven't been on my regular schedule of uploading two videos per week recently, it's because I'm getting ready for for my Christmas Tune of the Day series. For those who don't know, starting December 1st, I post 25 videos in 25 days on my channel of popular holiday songs. This year I'm putting a lot of time into it and I'm really making sure that each video is as good as it can be. I'm collaborating with a lot of people that you might know, people you've seen before on the channel, and some people you haven't seen before on the channel that I think a lot of you know. So stay tuned for that, it's coming out December 1st. I will be putting out a separate intro video for that right after Thanksgiving. So without any further ado, let's get into the question. Digoss777, by the way, if I butcher some of these names, I apologize. What is your alto sax setup? I was actually thinking about doing a separate video on my instrument setups for each of them, but uh, my alto setup is a Mark VI. It's a 1974, 224,000, so it's very late, right before the Mark VII. Um, I use a bone stock Meyer 5 medium mouthpiece. Uh, an Eddie Daniels Rovner, 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 ligature, and uh, D'Addario three medium select jazz reeds filed. This one comes from Patrick Ying Carlson. Was the saxophone your first instrument and when did you first start playing it? So the first instrument I started playing was piano when I was about four or five years old and I took lessons for that for about 10 years and I started playing saxophone in fourth grade so I was around nine years old. C. McNabbles? asks, where'd you go to college? I went to William Patterson University. So these next two are about Altissimo. I'll group them together. J.M. Young says, what are your favorite resources or books for learning Altissimo fingerings? And Cody Laurie says, tips on improvisation and improving tone in the upper register on alto sax, Altissimo. Any warm-ups that help with either will be greatly appreciated. So I'm gonna get to the improvisation thing later, but as far as Altissimo goes, there's the Sigurd Rascher Top Tones book, which is really, really good uh, for learning the overtone series. And I think that's where it starts, how to voice the notes on the saxophone using the overtones. And then really it's just about incorporating altissimo into regular practice, doing scales, arpeggios, and improvisation up there. You know, once you can play the notes, I would suggest improvising, you know, using only notes, maybe palm keys and higher on the alto or tenor, or whatever you're playing. So just really incorporating them into regular practice, making it a part of the instrument is how you can get more comfortable playing those notes. Bamakin's Art says, do you prefer alto or tenor sax and why? Personally, alto all the way. I'm not a tenor player. So when I play tenor, I'm an alto player playing tenor. The voice inside my head I have is alto and that's the most comfortable for me. 88 key, no problem, says, what is a backdoor 251? Basically, if we're talking in the key of C, it's when you go F minor to B flat seven to C major, just like in the beginning of Lady Bird. Joey Wagner says, what is your opinion on Berkeley College of Music or Eastman, worth the money? So I didn't go to either school, so I can't really speak to it firsthand. I know some people that went to both of them. Um, and any school is only worth the money to you if one, you have the money for it and you want to get something out of it. If you get something out of it that validates the money you spent, then it's worth it to you. So I'm not gonna say yes or no one way or the other. I know that certain schools excel in certain things. Like for example, Berkeley, I've seen some of their facilities and they have fantastic, phenomenal top of the line recording studios and audio engineering, things like that. So if you wanna go for that, that might be you know a great place to go to. As far as Eastman goes, I don't know really too much about it, so I'm not the person to ask. Um, but like I said, any, any school can be worth it and any school can be not worth it to you. It really depends on how much money you want to spend, what teachers are there, if you're talking you know, a specific instrument, are the teachers there that you like, is it an area that you want to be? So those are all factors that go into what school you're going to pick. Eris Dolce says, exercises to build really good technique, especially matching tongue and fingerings up. So for this, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about saxophone. Um, Playing through bebop melodies is really good. Playing through any etudes you have. The Lenny Niehaus Jazz Conception Series is really good. I don't know what level you're at. They have a beginner, a medium, advanced uh, book and for each one of those. And it's, it's really good because it writes in all the articulations for you. Uh, so just reading through actual things. You know, playing scales is cool. Playing arpeggios is fine. And playing through chords and all those permutations is, is really good and really helpful. But for me, context is king. If you want to be able to play bebop lines, practice bebop lines, whether that's playing melodies 
And yes, playing transcriptions of people's souls. You don't have to transcribe everything yourself, especially if you're working on technique and fingers and articulation and that kind of stuff. Kenny Hammond, 305, asks, can you play bass? Very, very poorly, very poorly. Richiro F says, can you play trombone? Yeah, I could play a little bit. So these next two questions are about how to play over giant steps. Zilbs asks, how do you shed giant steps? And Jarek Stanek asks, most important thing when soloing over giant steps. I'm gonna do a complete separate video on giant steps because I think a lot of people are really scared of it. And it's really not that scary of a tune. There are a lot of tunes, a ton of tunes, that I think are way more difficult to improvise over than giant steps. But the biggest thing I can tell you is five to one. If you can play five to one, you can play giant steps, no questions asked. You don't have to worry about Coltrane cycle, you don't have to worry about all that other stuff. Five to one, that's all you need to know. There's a little more than that, but for right now, five to one. Luca Rodriguez asks, can you play the giant step solo on a carinet? <laughs> yes. Yes, I can. Hamish Foliot says, clarinet or saxophone, which do you like better? Saxophone, definitely. Now, I love listening to clarinet and great clarinetists, but for personal playing and, and performing, definitely saxophone. ADZ Sax asks, what's the meaning of life? Praise the chosen one every day. That's it. Nicola Nordemir says, Do your students know you're on YouTube? Yes. A lot of them love the channel and they watch it and uh, they think it's really funny. EMC Glennon says, Thoughts on the importance of doubling, specifically clarinet as an alto player. So, this is another one of those things where it really depends on your goals. Depends on what you're trying to do and what you're trying to play. So if you're talking about jazz doubling, usually we're talking about big band. And in that case, alto players are usually going to double on flute, tenor players on clarinet, barry player on bass clarinet. But I've been asked many times to play in a big band, alto and clarinet and flute. So what I would say is, if you're going to double, do flute and clarinet if you're an alto or tenor player. Get them both down. Now, if you're talking about pit orchestra playing, that's when double reeds come into play. Uh, you got to add bass clarinet, all those other things. But if you're just talking like the beginning parts of doubling, whether you play alto or tenor, I would definitely say flute and clarinet. Haphazard Halls asks, what's been the most useful thing somebody has taught you in regards to improvising? A solo is only a solo if you're the only person playing. Okay, if you're out in front of a rhythm section and you're playing while they're accompanying you, that is not a solo. We call it soloing because it's easy and, and we kind of accepted that term. But what you're doing is you are the lead voice in a group song. Okay, you are the lead voice in that instance. So, yes, you are leading the improvisation aspect of it, but you are interacting with a group, an ensemble, a rhythm section, a duo, whatever it is. Be in the moment and be interactive and listen, listen, listen. Do not go out in front and play as if you're playing with a backing track. I guess unless you're playing with a backing track. But if you're playing with real musicians and you're improvising out in front of them, you know, I say out in front, and just, you know, if you're the one improvising and they're accompanying you, it's still a group effort. It's not them just laying down a specific thing and you doing whatever you want with no regard to what's going on. Always be listening to what they're doing. They should be listening to what you're doing and collectively you will come up with something that hopefully is musically rewarding. Eric Parmeli says, I've been playing classical saxophone all my life and now switching to jazz. How do I get the fatter, jazzier sound that I hear you and so many other great saxophonists get when playing? Thanks. First of all, thank you. Tone is my uh, number one thing. If I have a good tone, I'm happy. That's the number one thing I focus on before anything else. And if you're talking about a fatter, jazzier sound, I think it comes down to really your embouchure more than gear or anything else. A lot of classical players have a more more cur curled bottom lip. They're a little tighter, everything's a little firmer, and they, they kind of voice the note ooh or e. Whereas jazz musicians, you know, when you, when you want that fatter sound, a lot of times you have your lip out a little more and you're gonna think the term aw. So that's what I think when I play aw, 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 aw. That's the syllable. It helps relax the tongue, relax the throat opens everything up and then you can push the air through. Don't feel like it's constricted up. Feel like you're sitting down all. That's how you get that bigger sound. Two Penam bag. Oh, sorry guys, I apologize. How to have a good tone on many saxophones. If you're gonna play multiple different kinds of saxophones, soprano, alto, tenor, barry, whatever, I would say when you're practicing, really get into the sound of that individual saxophone before moving on. Don't just say, I'm gonna play alto for five minutes, tenor for five minutes, barrier for three minutes. Just, you know, really get inside the sound. And when you're playing alto, you're an alto player. When you're playing tenor, try to get inside of what a tenor player is. 
you know, even though I said I'm an alto player that plays tenor, when I'm playing tenor, I try to think tenor, think tenor. I don't think like how I play on alto and then try to translate to tenor. I'm thinking as a tenor player. So really, if you get inside each instrument's head, that'll be the best way to have the specific tone for that saxophone, because they are all different. You should be thinking differently on each one. Nick Larrick asks, where did you learn to play guitar? So Nick, I'm, I'm assuming you're asking about my smooth jazz video, which I'll link right here, and uh, how I got so good at smooth jazz guitar. Just watch that video and it shows you exactly how I did it. So the next bunch of questions are all about improvisation, so I'm gonna link them all together. How do I improvise using the chords? What do I do after I know how to solo over the blues scale? What should I practice in order to improve my improv? Tips on shedding improv, please. How should I improve my solos? And how do you practice on soloing or how do you work around with little practice time to get the film experience out of it? Not sure about that ending part. So in general, improvisation is just creating a melody during a song or creating melody over chord changes, if, if you will. And for me, the biggest thing is understanding what the song is saying and what the chords are saying and, and the roadmap and navigation of the chords and then creating a melody that fits over those chords or that tells a story through those chords in some way. Okay, forget about licks, forget about even, you know, specific chord tones or rhythms or anything. What you're doing is creating melody. So whatever that melody might be, it might be a bebop type melody, it might be a, um, a more lyrical kind of long note melody. It might be whatever you want it to be. It might be a very a tension melody that resolves at the end or, or consonant the whole time. Whatever the melody is, it's all about creating melody. Okay, and that's the biggest thing. So, you know, I'm gonna do another video series, I think, on just improvisation specifically, because there's way too many things to get into. But what I can say is create melody. Don't just try to play scales. Don't just try to play chord tones. Don't just try to play rhythms. Try to play melody first. And then for you, what is melody? Do you want it to be long notes? Do you want it to be fast running lines? What kind of melody do you want? That's where it starts. Off Brand TK asks, how do you practice jazz sight reading? All state auditions, honor band auditions, and everything in between always has heavy emphasis on sight reading, sometimes being worth more than the etude itself. Yes, a lot of programs like all state bands, summer programs, and high schools, uh, especially ones that I'm involved in, are really big on sight reading. I think it's a great thing. Lots of gigs that you're gonna end up playing, you're gonna be reading music for the first time on the bandstand, so it's important to be able to pull the music off the page. The big thing for sight reading, whether it's jazz or anything else, is just do it more often. There's really no secret to it. It's do it more often than when you are practicing it. You know, pull out whatever melodies you want. Be very strict with yourself. Put on a metronome. I don't care how slow it is. Put on a metronome and don't stop. Play all the way through. Then go back, you know, record yourself. Go back, listen to it. See exactly where you faltered. Was it notes? Was it your fingers that got faltered? Was it a rhythm? You know, a lot of people can play lines when sight reading. And once they get into an eighth note line, they can sight read it really well. One of their issues is if they have a held note or they have rests, they rest for a beat too long, a beat too short. They hold a note for a beat too long, beat too short. So as far as rhythm goes, rhythm is always gonna be more important than the notes when sight reading. Okay, if you play the right note but the wrong rhythm, it's gonna sound wrong. Play the right rhythm but the wrong note, you can get by because at least it'll keep the whole context. If you start, if there's no one else playing and you start the first measure one beat late, and then play everything perfectly, literally every single note is gonna be one beat late after that. So if you're not playing with a backing track or anything where you can hear where the downbeat is, you have to be very strict with yourself of knowing where one, two, three, four are. S. Killer Son asks, who's your most transcribed player? 100% Dick Oates. If you've heard my playing, you can probably guess that. Alex Greenberg, one, two, three, asks, ultimate practice productivity. Shorter, more focused sessions. So many people, especially in jazz music, they think like, oh, I'm just gonna put in the hours today. I'm gonna just like shed a blues for nine hours today. Most of those nine hours are probably gonna end up being wasted because you're just kind of floating around. Focused, shorter practice, whether practice sessions or practice uh, just little blocks, more focused, have a specific goal in mind. If you're playing to play, that's fine, but that's not practicing, okay? If you're practicing and you wanna be productive when you practice, say, this is my goal, I'm gonna practice for this amount of time and attack it as quickly as possible. Saxologic asks, what is a solid practice routine for the advanced sax student, particularly for strong fundamentals? Once again, I'm gonna be putting out a separate video or video series about practicing because it's not something I can just talk about, you know, in a short little clip like this. But basically, you want to be over-prepared for any situation. So that means over-prepared in tempo. You need to be able to play things, scales, arpeggios, etudes, songs, improvise 
as fast as possible. Even if you'll never play at quarter equals 300 plus, it's good to be able to do that. I always equate it to this bench press analogy. If you're having a bench press competition, you had to pick between two people to be on your team. It was a 225 pound bench press for one rep. You have one person who can do, you know they can do 235, one person that can do 315. I'm always gonna pick the person who can do 315, even though both of them are beyond the 225 mark because there's a greater margin for error. Just like if I wanna be able to play a song at quarter equals 200, I'm not only gonna practice up to playing quarter equals 210 or 220. I'm gonna make sure I can play things at 300 plus so that way 200 is way in my wheelhouse, okay? So tempo is one thing. The other thing, same thing applies with keys. Even if you'll never play in F sharp major or B major, which if you're an advanced saxophone student, I'm sure you're gonna play in those keys and you have played in those keys, be able to play in all 12 keys. Be able to play just as comfortably in F sharp as you do in C. Is that realistic? In most instances, for most people, no. There are some freaks out there. You know, Michael Brecker, Dick Oates, Gary Smullyan, those people can just play in any key and it sounds like they're playing in, you know, C major, G major, whatever. But being able to play in all those different keys comfortably will help you then play back in the original key, whatever that is. But like I said, I'm probably gonna make a separate video or video series on this. Good question. Chahik Sims asks, what is the secret to being the smoothest in the game? Once again, praising the chosen one every single day. A.N. Kahana 21 asks, do you approve of slap? Slap. Meme Bazaar asks, what summer programs do you do? The only ones I work at regularly are the Philadelphia Jazz Orchestra summer camps held in Princeton, New Jersey. You can check those out. I believe it's philadelphiajazzorchestra.org. Uh, or something like that. If you Google Philadelphia Jazz Orchestra, you'll find out. But I do that every summer. It's really great for uh, middle school and high school students. The Insane Player 05 says, The Lick. <laughs> Timothy Kim asks, How to get better at vibrato on alto? I actually learned this from uh, a couple of my friends who played classical music a long time ago. But they use a metronome and do pulses during the metronome. So they might set the metronome at whatever tempo and they'll say, I'm going to do four pulses. Yeah, 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 and using the embouchure, uh, vibrato, not air for saxophone. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then we'll say group of five. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then six and seven. So you get actually really in control of it. Then when you're playing, you know if you want a faster vibrato or slower vibrato. So I would use a metronome. What happened to the smooth jazz series? Nothing happened to it. Didn't go away. Um, I'm just focusing on some other things now, like the Will of Play series and the Christmas tune of the day. But I promise, when the new year comes in, I have a whole bunch of new smooth jazz videos coming on all instruments, but then I'm gonna also get back to the Smooth Jazz Saxophone series as well. Dakota Redden asks, you have a lot of talent, so what made you decide to become a teacher? First of all, thank you. Um, I switched from jazz performance to music education slash jazz performance when I was in college. I started talking to a lot of people that were out of school and a lot of people that were on the scene, if you will, and I was learning the real, real, real realities of what was going on out there. and being a hustling, strict, professional musician only did not appeal to me. I saw what the realities were. Can people make it happen where they have a great life and they have a house and they have lots of hobbies and go on vacations and just play music? Yes, but that is a very slim number of people and I didn't want to go the route of more than likely not being able to do the things I wanted because of my job. So that's why I switched to it and I still get to play lots of gigs and I still get to perform all the time and go do lots of things, but I get to choose what I get to play. I get to turn down gigs that I don't want to play or that, you know, if I want to do something on that day, I don't have to take every single gig. I can actually, you know, enjoy my life and enjoy people that uh, are outside of music and I don't have to dedicate every ounce of spare time to performing and practicing music. Jellyman552 asks, when are you going to play with our Lord and Savior on soprano? Listen, I just think, maybe not playing with him, I mean, that, that'd be obviously incredible, but I would love to get in touch with him about being on a smooth jazz video. He has a great sense of humor. So if any of you out there know a way to get in touch with him besides just spamming his Instagram or something, please let me know, or reach out to him for me. That'd be amazing, or you know someone that knows him. I think he would love to just do a little clip for a smooth jazz video. He has, a, like I said, a great sense of humor. I think it'd be right up his alley. All right, so that's gonna do it. That was a lot of questions. I know this video is kind of long, so if you stuck around till now, I really, really appreciate it. I like being able to do videos like this where I answer your questions specifically because I get them a lot through Instagram and through email. If you ever have any questions separately, not just for a video, please don't be afraid, just send them my way and I'll try to answer them if I can. 
but it's great to be able to do a video because a lot of you have the same kind of questions. And if I answer someone through email, that's great. It helps them. But that answer could help a lot of other people if I do it in a video. So I really appreciate it. Please browse my channel and subscribe. I have the Christmas Tune of the Day series coming soon. And you do not want to miss that. I have lots of other videos planned for before and right after that. So definitely stay tuned. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.